mind raising your hand? I'm just curious how many first-timers we have tonight. Okay, we've got several. All right, well, I'm excited about what we've been learning in the seminar, and I'm excited about some of the feedback I'm getting from you folks. And, and I, warned, I warned you on night one that this will be a life-changing look at Bible prophecy. And if you stay with me during this seminar, uh, there are going to be some very complex prophecies from the Bible that are going to be very uh, clear to you at that point. I will tell you, I'm not here to give you a lecture. Uh, lectures are for classrooms. I believe I'm here to give you a word from heaven. And so I believe with all my heart that what is taking place right now in this building is the most important thing that's going on in Lexington, Kentucky. And so I am glad you're here tonight, and I'm glad to be here. And um, as we cover ten, uh, tomorrow night's topic and some of the others, we're going to be the next few nights. Uh, I just want to tell you, you really need to be here. You know we're here for the Antichrist uh, tonight. The next few nights are going to be key to being here to follow up from some of the, the things we've been building up on. So I dare you to be here tomorrow night and Saturday night. Um, Night after night, you're going to see more and more things from your very own Bible come to life and perhaps some things that you've never seen before uh, and maybe some things you've had questions about. And, and I believe things are going to become very clear to you over the course of the seminar. And, and uh, we hit the ground running Friday night. We've built up a, quite a bit of momentum on Saturday night. We've covered a lot of ground. And the stuff that we've covered is going to, build up, it's going to pay off tonight as we look at who the Antichrist power is. And don't forget, tomorrow night we're going to look at... Uh, Revelation's Great Red Dragon is 666. We're going to see what that number 666 means. If you've ever wondered, um, you're going to see it from your Bible. Very easy to understand. Some of the upcoming topics that are, may not be listed in the, in the brochure is Revelation's Thousand Years. Uh, we're going to look at what happens the moment after you die. We're going to see... Uh, we're going to look at about hellfire, what the Bible teaches about hellfire. We're going to see exactly where hell is. We're going to see what the population of hell is tonight or that night when we look at it. We're going to look at Armageddon, the seven last plagues, United States and Bible prophecy, all kinds of things. So, so I hope you're excited. I hope you're going to hang with me through this seminar. And so before we get into our topic for tonight, I want to invite you to please pray with me. Lord, it is a privilege to be here uh, to share truths from the scriptures, but it's much more a privilege to be a child of the King and a child of Jesus. And so tonight, I'm praying that if there's a person or people here tonight who, who cannot make that claim with confidence, I pray that you'll touch their hearts, you'll draw them to you. And so I pray that Jesus will be lifted up tonight, and as we look at your word, as we look at these, this uh, prophecy tonight, we're praying for your power and your Holy Spirit to be here with you, guide us, and, and to bless us and to speak to our hearts. And I asked it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Revelation reveals the Antichrist is where we're at tonight. Um, and for those of you here on Friday night, we saw that God revealed in, Dan in Daniel chapter 2, 2,500 years of history, of world history in advance. Then Saturday night, we saw a lot of signs that, that pointed to the nearness of the coming Jesus. And we saw that the, the end of time is not just near, it's here. I mean, we are, we are there on the verge right now. In the second session, we saw some prophecies about Jesus and uh, about how Christ takes away the sins of the world. And, and tonight, I want to start out with a very special last day message. If you go to Revelation chapter 14, a very special last day message that as we spend time in this message a little later on in the seminar, this is something that God is, a message that God wants to share with the world before Christ comes again. The three angels' messages is what some call this. And so we're going to just touch on it tonight. I'm going to hurry through the messages and just lightly touch on them. First angel's message begins in Revelation chapter 14. It's page 1228, as you can see in the seminar Bible. It says, I saw another angel fly in the midst, this is verse 6, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. That's the first angel's message. We're not going to really spend any time on it. The second message, Revelation 14, verse 8. There followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. 
In Bible prophecy, we've been seeing some different meanings for things. In Bible prophecy, wine is, is doctrine and teaching. So Babylon uh, was the foundation of most, if not all, of the, a lot of the false teachings that we have in the world tonight. And we're going to talk more about that tomorrow night on Friday night. But the, basically, the second angel proclaims that Babylon is fallen. That these, and uh, as we saw on Friday night, there was a literal fulfillment of the nation of Babylon. It fell in, in 539 B.C., but there's also going to be a, a fulfillment, a last day fulfillment of this prophecy with the figurative modern day Babylon, as we'll talk about on another night. Let's look at the third angel's message, picking up in verse 9. The third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, we're going to see exactly what this mark is. Um, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This is the third angel's message. It says, basically, don't worship the beast and his image and don't receive his mark or you'll receive hellfire. Now, I want to tell you, this is absolutely the strongest warning found anywhere in Scripture. This is the one place in the Bible where we find that God says, I'm going to pour out my wrath without any mixture of mercy whatsoever. And so this is a very, very serious warning. And that makes me to think, because so many people are confused about this. What's the mark of the beast? Who is the beast? What is the number of his name? What's this 666 business? And, and we're so confused, and it completely contradicts what God is saying in my mind, because... If God was, would, would give the strongest warning anywhere in scriptures and say, if you don't understand this, you're going to be lost, do you think he would then make it impossible for us to understand it? Of course not. He wants us to understand this. And so to be under, able to understand what the mark of the beast is, we first need to know who the beast is. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. We're going to see who the Antichrist is. But first, let's do a little bit of review we saw the other night those kingdoms in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. We saw that uh, great metal image, the head of gold that represented Babylon. We saw the lion uh, with, the two, with the eagle's wings that also represented Babylon in Daniel chapter 7. And again, this is the world ruling empires that God had predicted in advance. Next, we saw this image had this chest and arms of silver, which was represented by this bear that was raised up on one side that had three ribs in its mouth. And it represented the kingdoms of Media and Persia. We saw the next kingdom was this uh, belly and thighs of brass, which was represented also in Daniel chapter 7 by this four-headed leopard that had two sets of wings. This was Greece, of course, headed by... Um, Alexander the Great. The next kingdom we saw was the iron monarchy of Rome, the legs of iron. We saw the beast had these ten horns that said it had great iron teeth and it devoured and destroyed and did all these things. And then and the next thing we saw was this ten divisions of Europe represented by those ten toes on that image and those ten horns on this beast. And so what I want you to do I just couldn't pass this up tonight. I'm kind of going to sidetrack us for just a minute. Go to Revel, uh, excuse me, Daniel chapter 8. I'm going to look at verses uh, 1 through 10. may not look at all of those in the verse 20 through 22. I told you there's this principle how the Bible will uh, explain itself as the first key to understanding Bible prophecy is go to the other scriptures to understand it. And the second pro uh, principle was to that the Bible often will repeat a, pro a prophecy and then it will expand it will give you a little more detail. And so we saw Daniel 2, that image. We saw Daniel 7. We saw those beasts that rose up out of the sea. Look in Daniel chapter 8, and I guess I need to go there. Daniel 8. Um, very interesting here, Daniel 8. I'm going to whiz through this, okay? And there's a lot more that could be said about this, but I'm not going to take time to do it. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, uh, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw a vision. I was by the river Uli. And notice verse 3, I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the last, and the, la the higher came up last. Who do you think that represents? This is years later. Babylon, you know, this is, uh, this is years later. So who, the two horns, who do you think this represents? 
Meet a Persia. I'll show you how in just a minute. Listen. Uh, verse 5, I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole ground, touched not the ground. In other words, he's moving so quick, he's flying, he's not even touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. So we've got a, uh, this sheep, this ram with these two horns. One of them's taller than the other. The bear lifted up on one side. Does that ring a bell? Uh, and we have this horn, this, this, this uh, ram that has this one horn between his eyes. And he's coming so fast, he's destroying so fast, he's not even touching the earth. Verse 6, he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran into him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close under the ram. He was moved with choler against him and smote the ram and break his two horns that there was no power in the ram to stand before him. And he cast him down to the ground. He stamped upon him and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he goat uh, waxed great. And listen, when he is strong, the great horn was broken and for it, for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Who do you think that notable horn was? Alexander the Great. When he died, what happened? The kingdom of Greece was divided up among his four generals. When he was broken here, these four horns come up in its place. These four, just listen, let, me, let the Bible show you that. Verse 20 through 22 tells us, The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Medo and Persia. So I'm not making it up. The Bible's saying that in the next verse. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the, ki the great horn that's between his eyes is the first king. It says, Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kings shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. So, you know, once he died, it wasn't in his power. The four kings that came up was his four generals. And so we saw that the other night. Anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. Go to Daniel 7 with me now, page 888. Daniel chapter 7, page 888. I'm going to pick up in verse 8. It says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So here we've got more info, and we touched on this the other night. We've got all of a sudden he, those ten horns on that, that terrible beast of, Ro of, of Rome. Then a little horn comes up among them, and it pushes three of these horns up. And it says he's got the eyes of a man and the mouth speaking great things. So what, who or what is this little horn? What does it mean with these eyes and this mouth? Look in verse 24. The ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another king shall, another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse or different from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So whatever this little horn is, it's going to push up, it's going to subdue three of those ten European nations. And, you know, we, we mentioned that before. We saw early, uh, the other night that the Ostrogoths and the, the Heruli and the Vandals are extinct. There are no more of those nations. There were ten. Now there's only seven. So it's no doubt in Daniel's mind he flashed back to these, the metal image with the toes, the ten toes, the ten horns. And Rome was, uh, the division of the Roman Empire was accomplished in 476 A.D. by the barbaric tribes that were coming from northern Europe. And so 476 A.D., and we saw the other night again that seven of those nations are still in Europe today. But what interested Daniel, here's where we're getting some new information. What interested Daniel most was this little horn pushed itself up among these ten horns, destroying three of them in its struggle. But, but notice this, the little horn troubled Daniel. Look at verse 15. It was different from the rest. Verse 15, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head trouble me. Why did the description of this little horn cause Daniel such concern? Look in verse 21 now. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Now verse 25, he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and a dividing of time. Who are these saints that it's talking about? Is this some football team from New Orleans that disappointed me in the playoffs? 
No, no, this is, this is God's people. This is the people, Daniel's people, the Jews is who he's talking about. So, it's, and, and the people of God, it says that this power is going to be a persecuting power against God's people. And it just troubles Daniel. He's worried about this. So Daniel recognized that this prediction was no longer just about secular history like we've been seeing, but it has now to do with God's, God's people because this little horn is making war and prevailing against God's people. So it has to be a hostile, uh, persecuting power. Now let's talk briefly now. We're going to shift to the gears to the Antichrist. Let's talk about what Antichrist means. A lot of people think that the term Antichrist means against Christ. It means one who takes the place of Christ is what it means, as you'll see as we go through the scriptures. In fact, 2 Thessalonians, if you want to go page 1178, I'll have this one on the screen, but page 1178, if you'd like to turn there in your Bibles. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Paul speaking here to the Christians in Thessalonica. He says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day... And you notice that the word day is capitalized there. This is referring to the, to the coming of Jesus. For that day the second coming will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, notice that, who opposes and exalts himself above all this call God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So Paul here in Thessalonians is referring to this Antichrist power and he's saying this man of sin, this, this, this power is going to seek to take the place of God. He's going to seek to, to set in, the, in his temple showing that he is God himself, that he will, wants to receive the worship that God gives that should be received uh, instead. And we know ourselves that, that no one could literally take the place of the sovereign almighty God, right? We know that. So, so Paul is obviously um, meaning that this Antichrist power, this, this man of sin, uh, is going to seek to lay claim to the power, the prerogatives, and the uh, position of God. He's going to try and get in the place of God. And we're going to see that as we go um, tomorrow night. This Antichrist power is going to take, try and take the place of Christ. And so tomorrow night, make sure you're here for that. You remember when Satan tempted Jesus uh, over in Matthew 4 and a couple other places. But Matthew 4, when he tempted Jesus, you know, the, remember the, the one he asked him, he says, I will give you all the kings of the world if you'll do what? Bow down and worship me. He wanted Christ's worship. He wants our worship. You'll see more about this not, tomorrow night. But the word worship is used in, uh, more times in the book of Revelation than any other book in the Bible. The, th the theme that we're going to see, the battle that's going to be going on in the book of Revelation is over the issue of worship. This is the great theme and the great concern of the book of Revelation. All right, Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13, page 1227. I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, upon his horns ten crowns, upon his heads the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, notice which gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So that means then, if we are somehow worshipping the beast, we're also worshipping the dragon.